words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I want to welcome all of you, and in the next uh, one-hour lecture, I'm going to explain uh, every thought that Dallas Willard ever had. <laughs> so there'll be nothing else to read, uh, nothing else to think about, and I don't know why it took him so long uh, to say what he did. <laughs> now, I remember one time he said, you know, I just stand up here and just talk endlessly. <laughs> hoping that, so yeah, Steve knows, yeah, just hour after hour, month after month, and hoping that, you know, something makes sense. I've been asked, uh, and I want to thank, by the way, uh, Gary Moon and Steve Porter for uh, inviting me to come and uh, talk on Dallas's uh, Four Cornerstones. I was privileged to be a student of Dallas's and got to know him and his wife Jane very well over a 30-year period. And I'll talk a little about that more this evening. But I was asked to speak on these, the four cornerstones. Now, Dallas Willard, of course, is a philosopher. And what we're going to do today is look at some philosophy. And I know not all of you are philosophers, and so I'll talk a little about philosophy. The definition, the exact definition, or etym uh, etymologically, is love of wisdom. But that's not very helpful. Uh, because, of course, then that throws up the question, well, what is wisdom? Now, a lot of people think, well, philosophy is something like this. Uh, either you say something that's so obvious that it's not worth saying, or you say something that is just completely false. And here's another example. That's life. All the truths are false, and all the falses are true. And for many people, that's what they think philosophy is all about. Uh, Dallas had a very different view of philosophy. He thought it was thinking about the most fundamental questions of life in a very precise and rigorous way. And his view was very close to that of C.S. Lewis's, who actually Lewis, many people don't know, studied philosophy uh, as an undergrad and a grad at Oxford, along with uh, medieval and Renaissance literature. But Lewis said a cultural life will exist outside the church, whether it exists inside or not. To be ignorant now, to be ignorant and simple now, would be to throw down our weapons and to betray our uneducated brethren who have under God, no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. The cool intellect must work not only against cool intellect on the other side, but against the muddy, he muddy heathen mysticisms which would deny intellect altogether. I need to, in order to get into the four cornerstones, I need to get into a few definitions. And let, just think of these as provisional. I don't want you to think that uh, I'm going to say everything that can be said about them. And of course, in philosophy, anything that's ever been said has been objected to by you know, 5,000 people. So. Uh, but these are at least a good starting point. Truth is probably the most controversial concept in the world today. Certainly the most controversial in the colleges and universities. And, uh, for example, the last place where I taught, Luther College, there were many faculty who said, well, they believe in truth with a small t, but not a capital T. 
And I said, now you're not talking about placement at the beginning of a sentence, are you? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> but they're talking about something different. It's very interesting that people have a problem with the concept of truth, but they don't have a, con they don't have a problem with the concept of lies. But what is a lie? A lie is an intentional concealment of the truth. So the concept lie requires the concept truth. So in the universities, people are all upset and will object to truth, but they're not upset about things like lies. And if you mention politicians who lied, they will tell you immediately about George Bush and the weapons of mass destruction and he lied and so on and so forth. The definition of truth is that it is a correspondence between a belief and what the belief is about. You're, so if I believe I have $5 in my wallet and I do have $5 in my wallet, then my belief is true. And if I believe that I have $5 in my wallet and I don't have $5 in my wallet, then my belief is false. And we all know that feeling of having a belief and having that belief run up against reality and finding out, oh, this belief is wrong. In high school, we seemed to run out of gas a lot in our cars. Okay. This was the days before having your parents' credit card. Okay. Now, how do you run out of gas? Well, usually you have a belief. You know. <laughs> and your belief is, oh, I've got enough, or I can make it home, or, you know. And when it runs out, you have this kind of uh, epiphany. Oh, and then you look, and maybe if your gas gauge is not broken, oh, I'm out of gas. Now, the truth of a belief is not changed by your feelings. It doesn't matter if you try to get everybody in the car feeling like you have a little more gas so we can get off the freeway and find a gas station. It doesn't push your car one more inch down the road. A few years ago, a Telstar satellite, and I, forget, I think it weighed 64 tons or something, was falling out of orbit. And uh, one of the Transcendental Meditation groups decided that they were going to meditate it back up into space. Well, it fell right on time to the second. <laughs> it made no difference whatsoever. You never have to teach a child how to lie. Children learn about lies because they learn about truth, and that's long before they've ever taken a philosophy class. <laughs> and they may not be able to articulate what truth is, but they have some idea. Now, knowledge builds on truth. And again, this will be provisional. This is a very, a very complicated and controversial thing, but a good place to begin, and I'll come back to it in my lecture also, is that knowledge builds on truth. So from the fact that I have a belief, let's say that uh, Bill Heatley here uh, was born in Minneapolis, that doesn't mean I have knowledge. Now, suppose it's true that Bill was born in Minneapolis. No, I'm Oh, okay. okay yeah. <laughs> but suppose it just turns out my belief is true. That still is not knowledge. It was just a guess. Okay? So, knowledge is more than truth. Knowledge requires that you have to have a belief. The belief must be true. You can't know what's false. And what happens when... You say to somebody, oh, I know the quickest way to uh, Walmart. And an hour and a half later, when you're out in the cornfield, well, I don't know if you have cornfields out here. I'm, I live in Iowa, so we, that's all we've got. 
And uh, you know, an hour and a half later, when you're at the end of a dead end street, and everybody in the car kind of turns and looks at you, what's the rational thing to do? Well, maybe I don't know. You withdraw your knowledge claim when it's been shown you don't know. Okay, so the rational person withdraws their knowledge claim when they've been shown you don't know what you think, what you believe is false. So you have to have a belief, the belief must true, the belief must be true, and finally the belief must be justified. And as Plato said, that means tethered down with evidence, okay? And there's all kinds of evidence, and maybe we'll get into that. But. Now, the, also we need the concepts of objective and subjective. Objective means having to do with the object itself. It also includes being public as opposed to private. Okay. Uh, mathematics is a really great example of something that is objective. It's public. It has nothing that your, your professor never asks you, now how do you feel about this equation? <laughs> it's irrelevant how you feel, you see. Your feelings don't matter here. And why, one of the reasons why mathematics is so difficult is because it is so sheerly objective. See, also why it's rather easy to grade, right? <laughs> Either you got it right or you don't. Subjective, on the other hand, means having to do with a subject, having to do with a person. Private is another way to think about it. So, so Becky's feelings are private events in her own life. Now, there's more involved, but they are at least that. Private, subjective feelings. My headache is not Brandon's headache, because my headache is subjective, at least in, in the important realm, in the important sense we're thinking of here. Okay, so those are some concepts. Now, the philosopher Frege and the mathematician Frege said, the single most important thing in all of thinking is to figure out what is objective, what is subjective. If you make everything objective, there are no persons. If you make everything subjective, there is no world. Everything just ends up to be your illusion or your experience. So there is a battle for the truth. And the four cornerstones of Dallas are based upon his cognizance of this battle. So here's Dr. Samuel Johnson. Truth, sir, is a cow that will yield such people, such as David Hume and other skeptics, no more milk. So they have gone to milk the bull. Okay. And for those of you who maybe have never seen a farm before, you try to milk a bull, you will uh, run into reality in incredibly quickly. Okay. <laughs> Probably the last thing you will see in this world. Yes. <laughs> Winston Churchill. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. And that, of course, ties it to truth raises a lot of very serious questions. And a lot of people structure their lives in such a way as to avoid truth. That's the only motivation they have, not to discover truth, not to follow truth, not to love truth, but to avoid it. And then this is Dallas's quotation, people don't like the truth because they want some room to wiggle around in. They don't want to be nailed down. And everything ends up to be kind of fluid unless, of course, they're critiquing someone else's views, and then they are sure that that person's views often are wrong. Now, here's an example of the battle for truth. Here's William Provine at Cornell University. 
distinguished professor of history, science, and techno techno technology studies, and ecology and evolutionary biology. Let, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Now, it all sounds so impressive, and it sounds like this guy really knows. But notice now, he says that this is what modern evolutionary biology tells us. And in that, it's totally laughable. You cannot find a modern evolutionary biology textbook which, on the basis of biology, comes to these conclusions. These are not biological conclusions. These are philosophical conclusions that have no relationship to biology at all. And so you see the four cornerstones of Dallas are aimed at taking on this kind of misappreh misapprehension of what is real, what is true. But there is a battle for the truth. Now here at Dallas Willard's four non-negotiable cornerstones. And I said non-negotiable, and I just mean by that, I don't mean he, hold, he held those dogmatically in terms of, look, I just am not going to change no matter what you show me. He means that on the basis of a lifetime of thought, he is prepared to stake his flag at this point and say, everything stands or falls on these four points. He's more than happy or was more than happy to engage in discussion and debate and wrote, of course, endless articles and numerous books on all of these things. But he thinks that these are the things which you cannot give up without disastrous consequences. That first, that reality is what it is apart from all human thought. And that is called metaphysical realism. Second, the most important parts of reality can be known to be as they actually are. And that's called epistemological realism. Three, human beings are utterly unique and non-reducible. And four, spiritual formation must be tied to objective evidence. Notice that objective evidence, not subjective, not how do you feel about this. So I want to look at each of these. I don't know. We'll find out how much time we have. We'll probably get less and less as we get to the fourth one because we're going to burn up a lot of time on the first two. Because if you give those up, well, then it's no use going on to the other two. One, that reality is what it is apart from all human thought. Now, the view called idealism says that in a way Thought itself makes reality. Thought itself, reality is just simply thoughts. So the philosopher Bishop Berkeley, for whom the University of Berkeley was named after, uh, be nice if they got the pronunciation right, but you know. Um, Berkeley said that a tree was simply a set of ideas. That's all there is to a tree. Now, what's that, what's that, what happens immediately? Well, that means that there are no objective trees, that the tree is really a set of ideas in someone's mind. Human being's mind, your mind, or good, maybe even God's mind. Well, there are immediate consequences to this. One thing is, none of us ever perceive the same tree. Because the ideas that are in uh, Becky's mind are a different set of ideas that are, that are in my mind. In the same way that Becky's headache is not my headache. 
So right away now, we just lost the world. Okay. Now, people say, well, it's okay because, look, I mean, it's really about what God perceives. And my ideas are correct insofar as they match up to the ideas of God. But people were quick to point out, it's a little hard to check your ideas against the ideas of God. Okay, how do I check my perception of the tree with God's perception of the tree? Nobody ever came up with any idea about how to do that. But you see, what you're doing then is you're denying metaphysical realism because what you're saying is, what is real has something to do with a mind. Another view that I'll just say I mean very little about is Kantianism after the, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant thought, well, the human mind doesn't, re I mean, things aren't really um, just a set of ideas. Trees are not just ideas, but the mind kind of um, structures the experience in such a way that we don't really know what's out there in the world. All we know is what we perceive. And so Kant said it's kind of like wearing a pair of pink glasses. Everything you see will be pink. Now suppose you can't take off the pink glasses and look at reality without the pink glasses on. You can never compare your experience to the thing, the, ex the thing itself. So Kant said phenomena is how things appear. The noumena is how things really are. All you can know is the phenomena, you can never know the noumena. Because you can never take these glasses off because it's part of the very structure of your mind. So notice a denial of metaphysical realism. And then finally I'll just throw in constructivism. It's another form of idealism that says, well, there's a way in which human beings kind of construct reality. My students often would kind of, oh, yes, yeah, so of course, we construct reality. We learn in, you know, rhetoric class that we construct reality. I said, well, if that were true, you'd have a lot more money in the bank. Okay, so uh, anyway, that's a little bit of a cheap shot, but uh, there is something that sounds very funny about, I mean, the, the, about us constructing reality, and the philosopher Hilary Putnam, who we'll look at a little later, uh, who was at Harvard University, he said, well, the mind in the world makes the mind in the world. Because you see, if you say the mind constructs reality, well, then is the mind itself the kind of thing that is not constructed? And he saw that to be problematic. So the mind in the world makes the mind in the world. And we'll see a set of problems with that. Now, he's not the greatest philosopher uh, in the United States, but he does pontificate and philosophize when he had his show before he uh, got thrown off the air. Um, and so here's Bill O'Reilly debating uh, Richard Dawkins. And uh, here's, here's the way the discussion went. O'Reilly, I'm sticking with Judeo-Christian philosophy and my religion because it helps me as a person. Dawkins, ah, oh, that's different. If it helps you, that's great. That doesn't mean it's true. Notice here, Dawkins is on the side of the angels. I mean, of course, he denies they exist, but he's on their side, yeah. Well, Riley, well, it's true for me. Now, that's a very funny kind of statement because we said before that truth was objective. And to say that something is true for you means it's both objective and subjective. And that's a contradiction. To say that something is true for me just simply means nothing more than I believe it. And from the fact that I believe something does not make it true. And then we already talked about it. You can have false beliefs. And any view that doesn't have a place for false beliefs is a bankrupt view. 
Well, it's true for me. See, I believe, Dawkins. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's just so, it's, you know, a tidal wave of confusion. <coughs> Dawkins, it's got to either be true or not true. We all learned that when we were like two. No, no. I can't prove to you that Jesus is God, so that truth is mine and mine alone, but you can't prove to me that Jesus is not. And now you've just got just total confusion in every direction. But anyway, it's, a, it's an example of somebody who's just not clear about the objectivity of reality, that it has nothing to do with your beliefs can't change it. Now, you can have beliefs about reality, and that's an important part of life, to have beliefs that fit in with reality. As Dallas used to love to say, reality is what you hit when you're wrong. You know? And you're sitting there, you know, at, after you've had a wonderful meal at an expensive restaurant, and you reach back to your back pocket to get your wallet. No, but you don't have a wallet. You left it at home. And all of a sudden, you have this, all of a sudden, the, the meal is not quite as enjoyable as it was. So, okay, the second point. The most important parts of reality can be known to be as they actually are. So this is really claim about knowledge, epistemological realism. And the three concepts I want to look at are, are questioning that. Empiricism, representationalism, and skepticism. Here's Hilary Putnam kind of saying something uh, along this line. He says, the correct moral to draw is not that nothing is right or wrong, rational or irrational, true or false, and so on, but that there is no neutral place to stand, no external vantage point from which to judge what is right or wrong, rational or irrational, true or false. But is this not relativism after all? Now, here's a man who wants to deny relativism. What's relativism? Relativism says there are no facts. There are no objective truths. And so Putnam wants to say, but look, and, and we'll talk a little about this also coming up. He says there's no God's eye point of view. No God's eye point of view. And then he raises a question but isn't this relativism, the very relativism he wants to deny? And usually by this time, this is an article, but when he gets in the same position in his books, he ends the book within a page or two, because it's just everything now has come off the rails. Here's another, here's a denial of knowledge about ethics, ethical knowledge. We have come to see that there is no possibility of a foundation for ethics, just as we have come to see that there is no possibility for a foundation for scientific knowledge or for any other kind of knowledge. So all knowledge is off the board. Science, that's nothing. All knowledge is off the board. Now you ask Putnam, well Putnam, is this sentence something we know? Because if it is, it's off the board. And this is one of the problems with, this is one of the problems with uh, denying knowledge. You end up making knowledge claims about there is no knowledge. Empiricism. So empiricism is really what's behind so much of the disasters in our culture today. And Dallas emphasized this over and over and over. And it goes back to a certain set of philosophers, uh, some of whom were well-meaning, uh, John Locke especially, uh, and, and even Barclay wanted to try to secure the world for, for God. Hume uh, was the third one and maybe not the best of motivations. But anyway, uh, empiricism just says, the only things you know are the things you can see, the things you can smell, the things you can taste, the things you can touch, the things you can hear. That's it. There's nothing more. Now, what are the things you can see? 
images? What are the things you can hear? Auditory experiences. And so all of a sudden now, we're talking about experiences. Locke introduces the special meaning for the word idea. He says, everything you experience is an idea. So empiricism takes you right into the mind. And again, I mean, there's a thousand ways to lose your world. And, and here's another one. Now notice if someone says, if someone asks, well, what, is empiricism true? Do you ever see, smell, taste, touch, or hear that empiricism is true? And of course not. It's not the kind of thing you could see, smell, taste, touch, or hear. So the very first move in empiricism is non-empirical. Here is an example. Here's a little philosophy uh, in the uh, Vaughn's grocery store. This is an old spice deodorant, uh, high endurance, uh, if it matters. Okay. And notice here, for $2.89, you not only get a stick of deodorant, high, intense, high in endurance, you also get a bit of philosophy that will completely destroy your whole life. <laughs> Experience is everything. That's all there is. It's everything. And I used to ask my students, now suppose you're getting married, and just before... You know, your guests are already seated, and just before you're going to walk down the aisle, your prospective spouse to, says to you, now, I just want you to know, experience is everything. And I mean by that, my experience. Should you marry that person? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's going to be a rather wild ride? Filled with disappointment and heartbreak. So this is empiricism. You see, so empiricism is that all knowledge comes from sense experience. So what are the things you immediately don't have knowledge, uh, knowledge of? Well, of course, God. Of course, the external world, because now we're just talking about your experiences. Jane, or, uh, Becky and I cannot look at the same tree, because Becky is seeing the image of her tree. I'm seeing the image of my tree. There's no public tree. So you just undermine the possibility of science. Empiricism, which was supposed to put science on a firm foundation, undermines the possibility of science because you don't have public objects. You only can have science if we can appeal to the same objective mind independent object. If we're both looking at the same petri dish or the same redwood tree or the same grasshopper. But once we have a private world of our own experiences, though they're just wind science out the window. Ethics goes out because, of course, you don't ever see, smell, taste, touch, or hear what's right or wrong, good or bad, and so on. So empiricism has some really serious problems. Now, we live in a world that is, we live in a culture, at least, that is pretty much completely bought into empiricism but doesn't understand the implications. Representationalism is just the view, and empiricism is a, view of, is a version of representationalism. Representationalism is the view that says you only get the representations of things, you never get the thing. Okay, so... Uh, you don't see the tree itself, you see the image of the tree, the experience of the tree. The experience of the tree is different than the tree. So Locke and the empiricists and Kant, these were all representationalists. And people talk, about, talk this way all the time. Sometimes they even tap their head. They say, well, I, I have an image of you know, the tree in my mind. Representationalism sets up what's called the veil of perception problem. And that is, there's a veil between you and the world. You can't get past that veil to the world. 
So all you have is your experiences. I can't know the tree itself. I can only know my experiences of the tree. I can't know God himself because I only can know my experiences of God. I can't know other people. I only can know my experiences of other people. Notice this kind of constant closing in. Everything keeps closing into the mind. I remember in a class once at University of Southern California, Dallas Willard said, now the mind is the great repository of all those things in the universe where you can't find a place for them. They just put them in the mind. And he said, and it's very roomy. <laughs> Plenty of room for everything. But I just say here, it, representationalism, views thoughts, perceptions, and experiences as trapped or enclosed or cut off from the world. This is known as the veil of perception problem. The view is that merely having experiences creates a veil that cannot be pierced or breached. It claims that we cannot know the world. We can only know our experiences of the world. And all of these are headed finally towards skepticism. And skepticism, and there's many roots to skepticism, uh, but skepticism just says you cannot know reality as it is. You can never get enough evidence or justification, and any of the evidence or justification you get is irrelevant. And therefore, you don't know. You can have beliefs but you don't know. And that's really where all these views lead, skepticism. Dallas, off, Dallas never tired of saying, in the university setting, it is the skeptic who is seen to be the smart person. That's the, the person who really can see through the whole facade and they don't have any beliefs about everything. There is a kind of reverence for that person, except in the sciences, and then you lose your position and they fire you because nobody in the sciences is going to be a skeptic. Okay? Or suppose you're you know, an engineer, work for Boeing. Well, I'm a skeptic about flight. Okay. Well, they just let you go. Okay. <laughs> Now, this next, now I'm going to start to turn the corner to try to say something positive about this. So this is a quotation I said to Dallas Willard. I came up with this conclusion. And Dallas got up from his desk and came over and hugged me <laughs> and said, now, now you see what the problem is. I've never forgotten that day. Skepticism presupposes an ontology of the mind, a view of the mind, an account of the mind, which makes the possible, well, that's a terrible sentence, which makes knowledge impossible. <coughs> Forget about the possibility of knowledge being impossible. Yeah. Makes knowledge impossible. You have a view of the mind, you start with a view of the mind, that makes knowledge impossible from the get-go. The philosopher Gustav Bergman, who was at the University of Iowa, and was before that Albert Einstein's mathematician, because he was better at math than Albert Einstein, said the skeptic is like a person who locks himself in jail, throws the key out the window, and then wonders why he can't get out. You see, skepticism has to say that you have really good, such good knowledge of one part of the world that you now can see that knowledge is impossible. And if you think about that for a second, that's a contradiction. So skepticism is always, global skepticism, which means about everything, is always self-defeated. Now, of course, we should be skeptical about many, many things. Probably every time you turn on the TV, you should be skeptical about anything you see that claims to be news. But you, that, from that, it does not follow that you should be skeptical, skeptical about everything. So this is all you see part of, of Dallas's uh, critique 
of the denial of epistemological realism. But now what about the positive case? So here I'll just give you Dallas's definition of knowledge. To know X or that P, I must be capable of representing X or the fact corresponding to that P as it is on the appropriate basis of thought or experience. It's just a more complicated way of, of the traditional, of saying the traditional definition that I gave you before, the, the justified true belief. Here are some confusions about knowledge. Knowledge has nothing to do with certainty. Certainty is a psychological state. It's not an epistemic state or a state of knowledge. You can be certain and not know. The world is filled with those kinds of people, unfortunately. And you also can know and not be certain, not feel certain. Uh, an example of this would be if you've ever parachuted before for the first time. And you go through the class and they explain to you that this is all the best equipment and, and uh, the, the chute has been packed carefully and correctly and you have all this evidence, overwhelming evidence that all of this is true. How do you feel when you're standing on the edge of the plane, you know, up at 22,000 feet? You do not feel certain, I tell you that. Knowledge has nothing to do with certainty. Totally irrelevant. Knowledge has nothing to do with actual or possible universal acceptance. You see, often people have said, well, if you knew, that means everybody would, would accept the same conclusion. Everybody would come to the same conclusion. And that's just simply not true. For uh, I'll give you a few reasons in a moment. Knowledge does not exclude interpretation. There have been people who have argued, well, look, uh, you've got to interpret things, therefore you cannot know. Or therefore knowledge cannot be objective. Knowledge always requires interpretation. And sometimes we discover that our interpretation does not match up to the way the world is. And we try to get a better interpretation. And hopefully as we get older and wiser, our interpretations of reality are better and better and better. Knowledge always involves interpretation because it involves consciousness and judgment. Knowledge is not some kind of pure, unmediated access to reality. So one of my professors at the University of Iowa used to argue, uh, Richard Fummerton, he used to argue, well, in order to know, you would have to be able to step outside of your own experiences and experience the world itself, and that's impossible. Therefore, knowledge is impossible. But knowing doesn't require that you have unmediated, unexperiential, uninterpretive experience. We all come to the world with our unique histories, backgrounds, prejudices, confusions, limitations, and sometimes we discover that what we have decided we know, we don't know, because we're wrong. So there's all these, people throw up these impossible standards of knowledge and say then, well, see, nobody knows. And then we, we talked a little about the confusion about uh, knowledge and a God's eye point of view. So Putnam says, there is no God's eye point of view. Now notice, to say that, you must have a God's eye point of view. So to say there is no God's eye point of view is itself a God's eye point of view statement, claim because you're claiming this is the way things really are. I'm going to skip the first one. It's a very interesting mathematical problem, but I'm running tight on time. But I want to just think the next one's very interesting. Uh, I mean, the first one's interesting, too. Matter of fact, uh, the Oxford philosopher J.R. Lucas said that that equation 
is um, as, um, as, as momentous as the discovery of, Mer of America, but more important, okay? <laughs> He's British, so you get that point, okay. Uh, but the Monty Hall paradox is a very interesting paradox. Do you all remember the show, um, Let's Make a Deal? Yes, no? Okay. My students in college have never heard of it, of course. Yeah, but anyway, the Monty Hall Paradox, you have three, three boxes, you know, behind two are goats and behind one is, you know, a zillion dollar car. And so the person chooses box A. They don't know where the, the car is. Chooses box A. And now Monty Hall would go and turn open box B or C. And of course, to show them, oh, well, this is a goat, or you know, a broken lawnmower, or something like that. And then Monty Hall would ask the question: Do you want to stay with your original choice, or do you want to switch? Now, most people think there's no difference in switching because it's 50/50. But in fact, that is wrong. And uh, a mathematical genius, uh, Von Savant, in Parade Magazine, wrote an article on this, and she got 10,000 responses. 1,000 responses were from PhDs. And most of them said that there's no difference between switching. They were all wrong. I'm thinking about universal acceptance here. You see, just, if, just because something's true does not mean that everyone will accept it. The, the uh, mathematician Paul Endos, who was one of the most prolific mathematicians of the 20th century, said there is no difference in switching, makes no difference whatsoever. He was only convinced he was wrong when a computer simulation was run out and shown to him that switching actually improves your chances of getting the car by a significant amount. And I can explain all of that to you later if you want. But my point is simply this. There are things that are true that not everybody can accept. This is why they don't have jury members on uh, family members on a jury. Why? Because the family member just can't believe. You know, you see this on the news all the time, you know. Well, I mean, my son would never do that kind of thing. Well, he does have a, a swastika on his forehead. Do you think that's relevant? <laughs> no, no, that kind of, you know. They try to convince a smoker that smoking is bad for them. They can't see that truth often. They have all the same evidence. They can't see it. So just because something is true has no connection whatsoever with uh, universal acceptability. Being closed-minded. If you confront me with my sin, that may be a very hard thing for me to see. So just because something is true does not mean that there's universal acceptability. Okay, knowledge requires consciousness, awareness, experience, and don't think just sense experience, and the essence of consciousness is intentionality. And, I, and I'm running late on time, but I just need to mention this to you because this is really at the heart of all of Dallas's academic work intentionality. Intentionality is a, a property of the mind that is aimed at something. The word actually comes from Latin to aim an arrow. Okay? And what that just means is that every mental state is of or about something. You cannot think of nothing and if you think of uh, just a black empty expanse, that's your, the object of your thought is a black empty expanse. Every act of consciousness we say takes an object. 
Mental states are not self-encapsulated entities, but always point to something else. Now that is the key for Dallas's epistemological realism. The mind is directed outward. You cannot consider thought as just events happening in the subjectivity of your own mind. They point outward into the world. They take you out into the world. There is nothing in the whole universe like thoughts. They are absolutely unique. Jean-Paul Sartre said, intentionality, the intentionality of thought is a mystery in broad daylight. Isn't that beautiful? Why is it a mystery? Well, because it's absolutely unique and you can't make it anything else. Why is it in broad daylight? Because it's the thing we're most aware of every moment of our waking lives. So Dallas spent 40 years on these concepts. Now, the act of consciousness and the object are logically distinct. So when I am perceiving the tree, my, my perception is of the tree, but my perception and the tree are two different things. The tree existed before my perception, and it will probably exist after. Okay? So they're distinct. They're two different things. But I cannot consider a thought, an experience, to just be a private mental thing. It is by means of my thought that my thought takes me to the tree. Now, just to, to tie in, to, make, to take this pedagogical moment, for Dallas Willard, all of this work was necessary for him to get a firm idea about that your thoughts take you to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a reality in the world. And your thoughts take you to that reality. And you now are able to discover all the wonder of that kingdom as revealed through Jesus, as comes down through the church, you know, as we learn about from other people. And, and as you see, so this is all incredibly important. And now I just need to add this, from the fact that every mental state is of something, it does not follow that the object which the act is of exists. So just because you see something does not mean it exists. To see something that did not exist is called an illusion. So just because you see something does not mean it exists. And Brandon here is working on those issues and many a great philosopher who's gone, gone over the falls in a canoe on this issue. <laughs> because of course if you say everything you experience exists, well, now you've got the world full of unicorns and all kinds of things. You know, things that you, you know, the people have illusions of. Someone punches you in the face and you see a big burst of stars. Uh, does that mean there are now more stars in the universe? Here's Dallas in his study. An act of faith in the biblical tradition is always undertaken in an environment of knowledge and is inseparable from it. And that all requires intentionality. Now, I'm going to just, here's a bunch of passages about knowledge from the New Testament. You can find all of these in Knowing Christ Today. Okay, and it's just tied in with knowledge everywhere. You just find passage after passage about knowledge. Let's go to third point. I'm gonna have to wrap up rather quickly or I will get thrown out of the room by David here. Um, human beings or persons are utterly unique and non-reducible. And that really has to do, I, I mean, one part of that is uh, the mind-body problem or the experience-brain relation. What is the relationship between my brain and my experience? Are those two things or one thing? And of course, we live in a culture that is completely committed to, look, uh, every experience is just a brain event. Now, this is an incredibly complicated field. Dallas 
uh, burnt a lot of night oil on this issue over the decades. And I'll just give you a little hint. Uh, here's not my favorite person in the world, but he's uh, at times not a bad philosopher, uh, Colin McGinn. And this great quotation, some people like to harp on the complexity of the brain as if this gave a clue to the mental, to its mental productivity. But sheer complexity is irrelevant. Merely adding more neurons and with more synaptic connections doesn't explain our problem a bit. The problem is how could any collection of cells, no matter how large and intricately related, create, could, intri, intri, uh, wait, uh, no matter how large and intricately related, could generate consciousness. The trouble is that neural complexity is the wrong kind of thing to explain consciousness. It is merely a matter of how many cells a given, it is merely a matter of how many cells a given cell can causally interact with. If our kidneys had as many cells as our brains, that would not make them conscious. Nor is the gal galaxy conscious just because it has a tremendous number of interacting parts. If complexity is to play a role in generating consciousness, then we need to be told what kind of complexity is involved. Here's another beautiful example from history, and it's just a very simple example, but Dallas loved this example. The philosopher Leibniz said, suppose you could, suppose the human brain was the size of, of a, a factory, a mill, and you could wander through that factory or mill. The simple matter of fact is you would never come across thoughts, experiences, beliefs. When, when the surgeons, when the brain surgeons open up your brain, they do not find thoughts and experiences. One of my students at the University of Iowa said, oh no, I think over at the University Hospital, they have a machine that can uh, read your mind and tell you your thoughts. I said, I think, I think you're getting confused. You're confusing the University Hospital with Star Trek or something. <laughs> yeah. There's no such machine, because they're not physical things. Current ideas that run our world. Materialism, everything is physical. Empiricism, hedonism, the only thing that matters is feelings. Radical individualism, and again, skepticism. What are the Christian alternatives? Dualism. There are physical and non-physical realities. Two, not all knowledge comes from sense experience. Hedonism leads to personal and social disasters. Our lives are necessarily intertwined. There are no victimless, victimless sins or crimes. Total skepticism is self-refuting. We know a great deal about many things. And finally, his last point, which I'm just going to mention to you. I'll say one or two words, and then I'm going to leave it at that. Spiritual formation must be tied with objective evidence. Knowledge always requires humility. When you know, you must always say, well, I could be wrong, though. I must be open to the evidence. If you get to the place where you say, hey, evidence does not matter for me because I am so sure. I can't be wrong. I go to X and X church or you know, whatever. We're never wrong. You're in danger because you see it takes away the virtue of humility. So, so spiritual formation claims about living and experiencing life with God require humility that we could be wrong. So, so Dallas just really wanted to stress this. I just want to end here because uh, I just have gone too long. Paul, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, he's not talking about sense experience here, is he? He's talking about the way you, you perceive the world, but not the things you see with your eyes. C.S. Lewis uh, anything that is not eternal is eternally out of date. Simone Weil, you could not wish to have been born in a better time when all is lost. She's Jewish convert to Christianity. 
and I will, uh, this is my second to last slide. Nothing is so beautiful and wonderful. Nothing is so continually fresh and surprising, so full of sweet and perpetual ecstasy as the good. No desert is so dreary, monotonous, and boring as evil. This is the truth about authentic good and evil. With fictional good and evil, it is the other way around. Fictional is good and boring and flat, while fictional evil is varied and intriguing, attractive, profound, and full of charm. Notice all the knowledge claims there, all the claims about knowledge. And then finally, uh, dear Dallas, this is Dallas on the last day at the university, his last day at the University of Southern California. And now you see these four cornerstones. Why are they so important? Summarized in 2 Peter, 3, 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So thank you. I mean, we're already over, so. Thank you.